Hello and welcome to IEEE Soft Robotics Podcast. In this podcast, we are going to interview researchers from Pulse Academia and Industry about their work, thoughts, spectrum, and more beyond that. This is Marwa Edwini, and I hope you will find this podcast useful. If you would like to connect with us, simply send us, and we will be happy to hear from you. And here is my interview. Thanks. Hello and welcome to IEEE Robotics Podcast. Hello, Sandy. Thanks so much for joining us in the podcast. Such an honor to have you. I would like to ask you how you would like to define yourself for the audience who may be first time listening to you. How would you like to define yourself? How to, how to define myself? Uh, I don't know. Farm boy makes good. I, uh, I, uh, I, I'm just an average guy. Um, I just... Uh, Happened to have got lucky a few times, and um, I'm not the cutest guy at this place. I don't have the highest uh, amount of education. Um, I'm good with coming up with new ideas, uh, and I've been working for a long time since since I was nine, and I'm 72 now. So um, it's been. Uh, I'm looking forward to retirement soon, maybe. <laughs> so since you highlight since you are nine years old, how was your childhood was as a kid? My childhood. Oh, except for school, it was fabulous. <laughs> I uh, I um, I lived on a farm. I um, I picked apples and walnuts and tomatoes and whatever and tobacco. And um, I was uh, I ran around, uh, you know, hunting rabbits and pheasants and ducks and stuff like that. Um, with the other kind of Indians, uh, the Native American Indians, lived very close to us, and so. They taught me how to go hunting without, without the need of a gun or a bow or spear or whatever. So I, I learned a lot of things when I was young. I wasn't really particularly good in school. Um, so uh, uh, I, I hated grade school completely. I went to one of those little teeny schools that they used to have in a country. I couldn't stand it. Finally, I got into a trade school. I went to, uh, I went to a school called... WD low technical. So I'm a low tech guy for real. <laughs> so uh, anyway, while that was going on, uh, my dad ran a factory um, and uh, like a tool shop. And so uh, he brought me in when I was 16. And the rule is you're not supposed to go into a shop until you're 18. But he knew that I hated picking apples. <laughs> so he, um, <clears throat> he got me in and I... Um, I was 18 for three years in a row. Uh, that's got to be some kind of record. And uh, so by the time I was 20, I, was, um, I had my journeyman's card. I was a bona fide toolmaker, and I was good at it. And um, everybody said, oh, you should go back to school. So I did. Uh, I don't know which one I would have <laughs> been happier with, but, uh, but anyways, uh, I went back to school. I... Um, I uh, became the chief engineer of uh, one of the companies that I worked with when I was a toolmaker. Its uh, name was Valiant, and uh, they were the biggest single uh, family owned uh, tool shop in North America. They were huge. Lots of other companies inside. They are actually were purchased by an Indian company uh, just recently. So um, uh, I was the chief engineer. I was in charge of a big line that uh, that um, uh, made uh, made cylinder heads and intake manifolds, and when I got done, Ford offered me a job, and uh, I went. I spent ten years at Ford. I started as not as a chief engineer or anything. I had 120 people work for me when I was uh, when I was chief engineer at Valiant, but when I went to Ford, it was just me. I was a manufacturing engineer. Came in, made more money. <laughs> Made more money with no headaches. I liked it. So, uh, so I was there for 10 years. I went from a 6 to a 13, and I wound up in finance staff. So, and during that time is when I met Dr. Deming. Dr. Deming talked to me about life in general, and uh, he was the one who convinced me to quit Ford and start my own company, and I did, and here I am. So we've worked on everything now from Barbie to the space station, literally. That's not a metaphor. So there you go. Everything. Now you know. 
uh, fantastic. Maybe for, for going that, I'm curious to ask you, what's something you think is very challenging when it comes to manufacturing, for example, automotive industry or space application, for example, since yeah. you also work in aircraft. So what is still you think is most challenging aspect in manufacturing when it comes to automotive industry or aerospace as well? For aerospace, everything has to be as light as it can possibly be. You have to continuously remember that this is going into space, so it's going to have no weight when it gets there, but it, getting it there has got to be as light as possible. So that's the first thing. And then you have to also remember that rules and regulations we have on Earth don't work in space at all. Um, you, you don't want to have anything, any kind of lubrication, for instance. You want to make sure that no matter what you do, it's loose, very loose to, uh, to like to unfold a satellite's um, arrays. You, you want to make sure there's plenty of clearance because no matter which way that satellite um, goes up and is in space, sooner or later it's got to turn into the sun. And as you open the arrays, you have to make sure that they're going to open because if you have a tight tolerance, um, one side's freezing cold, the other side is burning up. So you have to make sure that, that everything is going to work when you get there. And, and you, you ha you, there's no forgiveness. You can't adjust anything. No one's going to come up and, uh, you know, oh, well, it's, we just touch this up or that up. That's all gone. So those types of things are the things you look at from a space standpoint. And We've been very lucky. We were working with uh, one one company that was uh, going to have an arm, not an arm, but an end effector on the Canada arm, and they were going to drop a satellite out of the uh, out of the uh, Challenger, uh, not the Challenger. Um, I want to be maybe it's Atlantis. I'm not sure, but anyways, one of them. And uh, the chief engineer did not want to fool around with anything. You know, he had it all figured out. And we found out that <clears throat> there was there was going to have to be an adjustment made, and uh, we never heard of adjustments before, uh, ever. Nobody ever does that. The astronaut is out there, uh, you know, to help release the uh, the product, but you don't make adjustments, and that adjustment would have been impossible in space. In space, you don't want to use a wrench. There's nothing to. There's nothing to push against. Everything should be like, I want to have everything where I'm going to click together or separate it apart because I've got nothing to work with. If you pull it on a wrench, it, you just go around and you, nothing will work. So this guy had forgotten that. And that adjustment would have been basically a, missing lo a mission loss. That would have been, I don't know, three, 300 million bucks down the drain, not to mention you got to do it again. So uh, it's important that you think of every aspect in space. With automobile production, um, probably the biggest thing is to make sure you start off with quality parts. Make sure that your, um, your, your people, the, uh, the, the line workers and whatnot, are properly trained and have the right tools. And, um, and try your best to, uh, to design the product with the minimum number of parts. That's, that's what we usually start with is how do we how do we take someone's product that um, um, you know a product that uh, that functions okay and turn that into something that can be manufactured at at level so that you can actually make money at it because just because something works doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be the right thing for the customer you have to make sure that the customer is going to be satisfied with whatever it is and it works all the time and then the second thing is, you have to make money at this stuff. You don't make any money. Uh, nobody, no customer is ever going to see it because they're never going to pay the right. They're never going to pay the money that you you need or want to have in order to make it work. So, those are the things that. Those are the things that, if you're in in general, those are the things that you want to make sure you've done correctly online. Oh, the other thing too, is suppliers. <clears throat> if you want to, if you want to be successful. You have to pick the right suppliers, and that's uh, that's right down to, like uh, I tell a story about the guy. I, I was in um, I was in a place called Labrador, and uh, they uh, they mine iron ore there, and I was there with uh, one of the bigger 
construction or uh, yeah, construction, whatever, excavation companies. And they made these gigantic um, excavators. Um, one shovel basically fills up a truck. And I'm standing there and I'm looking and I look down. I say, w- who's that guy over there? The guy, the Eskimo guy. Um, and he said, oh, he's not an Eskimo. He said, well, what is he? He said, oh, he's some guy from Honda. What he was there for was to, he wanted to look at that grain structure, you know. You can see the bands of iron ore. He wanted that band. He didn't want that. He didn't want this. He only wanted that part right there. He was qualifying the iron ore because he knew what to look for. And he wanted to make sure that when that iron ore got to Japan, It was going to be exactly what he was looking for, and it was going to perform exactly the way he wanted to make it work. So I went back to my buddies at Ford who were always trying to figure out how does Honda, you know, uh, get cars out uh, with minimum number of hits. And I said, well, they qualify the ore. Ah, ah, ah." they didn't believe me. But that that makes a big difference. When when you're looking at, um, at consistency, you have to go right back to the dirt, as it were, in order to uh, in order to make something work really well. So maybe I, I would like to ask you, curious to ask you about the material science when it comes to fabrication or also manufacturing, because you mentioned something very interesting about that. Me, sometimes we underestimate from the material as well. For example, you mentioned El Tesla, for example, they invented their own material. And I'm curious about you, how do you see the invention of the material? And even I really admire when you explain for cyber truck design and how the material also play uh, or go hand, hand in hand with the design when you select the material and the design of the structure for the vehicle. So if you can tell us some yeah. more about that. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so when people, when people have a problem, as a rule, the ordinary people will go and, um, and pick up a book, open the book, try and find the material that most, or the characteristics that most looks like what they need, and then, you know, you go, and you, and you read whatever that material is, and that's what you use. Um, what's different with Tesla is they looked at the characteristics that they wanted to have, and they weren't really interested in what was in the marketplace, so they concocted their own creation. Now, that type of uh, assessment or that type of, of uh, deep knowledge of what is going to give me the material I'm looking for and, and putting it together like, uh, like grandma's cookie batter, that's a whole, uh, that's a, that's a whole different level than what, what I ever, I, I never saw that at Ford, never. I never saw it at Ford. I, in fact, I can't, I don't think I've seen it ever in any, anything. We, and that's not true. Okay, so we did do that kind of stuff when we were working with some, uh, some DOD kinds of projects, and we did do that for space as well. Space and aircraft, sometimes you have to find, you have to invent new things in order to make them happen. Chemical batteries and on and on. So. That kind of stuff is where you find that people are going to become more and more inventive. But uh, it, doesn't, it does not happen uh, too often in the automotive world. And that's where, that's where Elon Musk is uh, set apart from everybody else. Nobody, I don't know anybody that, uh, that can crank like that guy can. And after spending like four hours with him, uh, watching him in action, there's no CEO on the planet that I've met uh, that's like him ever. I heard that in the olden days, <clears throat> like when um, when uh, the Douglas family uh, turned out the DC three, all those guys were they were really really knowledgeable and they invented things. Everybody else was running around with you know uh, wood and canvas and gluing planes together and whatnot. Here they come out with this aluminum. Um, aircraft with big engines and everything. That, that kind of stuff happened uh, in the United States anyway a long time ago, but it doesn't happen so much anymore. And you never, I've never, I have never been in a board meeting, and I've been in a lot of board meetings, but I've never been in a board meeting where the, the chairman of the board or the president says, 
Hey, let's dig into some details now for two hours on something that's uh, so exotic that there's maybe a half a dozen people on the planet can understand it. And, and, and then goes in and, well, the formula for this is dot, 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 dot. Oh, wait a minute, uh, Elon, that's not quite right. It's this, 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 this. Oh, yeah, you're right. I made a mistake. That never happens ever. Never, never. There's no executive ever that ever admitted that they made a mistake ever. It just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. And if you correct them, that's your mistake. You'll be gone. Interesting part. Actually, even in academia, we have the same issue. So I think this is something, yeah, yeah very interesting to see to someone like that. But I'm curious, yeah. I, maybe we can discuss that later about being knowledgeable and have to, having the risk and idea. Because he, he just, I think that when you have the risk and idea to, to design innovative material, and yeah. at the same time, you want to make a profit. How do you see this kind of, maybe, comparison between going to risk in ideas and also you want to make something that customer that appreciate it how does this equation whenever you see it huh? yeah okay so here's what i believe um the greatest risk is no risk at all sit back um in the parade of business and uh, the elephants are right in back of you and they will flatten you where you sit um risk is something that's extremely important um, if you don't risk, people call it R&D. It's not. What, what it really needs to be is, is more risky. You have to be, you, have, you can't be risk averse. Um, you, you have to be pushing the envelope. And if you're not, you're going to lose. Now, I just, I just seen this uh, thing on, um, on uh, Intel a little bit. And Intel is spending billions of dollars on R&D but they're being eaten alive. NVIDIA and all the other, everybody is passing them by. How, why is that? What happened there? Well, they focused R&D on things that don't matter. Or they gave the R&D to people who have a pet project that isn't gonna go anywhere. The problem is, is that with Intel and many other big giant companies, they're run by finance people. There's no chance for success, none. I mean, you'd think that people would catch on. I, you, there's lists. I mean, Steve Jobs, okay, Apple, they, um, they tossed him out because the finance guy said, oh, this guy's a fruit, he, he, he's not right. He doesn't talk our language. They tossed him out. Apple was down to nothing. And finally, somebody brought him back. And he comes up and he says, we're going to get into the iPhone business or First it was iTunes, and we're going to get into this business or that business. Uh, that's not, that's too risky. And what happens? They succeed. If you have an MBA, and uh, uh, by the way, <laughs> um, <clears throat> Elon Musk and I are on exactly the same page for this. If you have an MBA, um, if you're an engineer with an MBA, you're pretty much useless um, if you follow the rules of the MBA. My wife has an MBA and a PhD and a master's in manufacturing engineering and she graduated from college and <laughs> and I uh, couldn't shine her shoes for from an education standpoint. Her, her description of the MBA was um, I wasted four years of my life and you only figure that out at the end. So I tell engineers uh, here, if you want to get a master's in mechanical engineering or you want to get your double E, I don't care. That's fine. You watch how fast I shovel the money out to pay for you. You want to get an MBA? Uh, you're on your own. And by the way, I know you're going to be leaving, so mm, there's no promotion for you. <laughs> I know what's going to happen. You're going to go and, uh, and do something else because it looks like it's easier somehow. And it's not. And actually, one of our guys is coming back. He got his MBA. He went out there, tried everything he wanted to try, found out that, hey, you know what? This is crap. I want to, I want to invent things. I want to be an engineer. And he's coming back. So uh, what's the date today? Oh, he's coming back on Monday. There you go. March the 1st. So, well, the same thing is true with, with big business. If you're in the manufacturing world, and you have people that aren't engineers at the top of the house, it, it ain't gonna work, it's gonna fail.
Yeah, I really like this point, Sandra. I think it's very interesting. Even when we, in the podcast, we have discussion about the idea that we develop, even in academia, this model of publication, but we don't have real tangible impact or how we can design products that could be beneficial to humanity or make sure it could be beneficial. And when we, example of Ellen, for example, he's just a CEO and he really have a deep understanding of physics and also with the material. And this is fascinating. Why do you think the problem we have, maybe in education and, um, for example, the PhD and, um, yeah, for, and we have to, MBA, why people do that if, uh, you know, how we can solve that if we just we need people mm. to be working in the beneficial things only and don't waste their life in something? Usually, okay, so my wife and I are vastly different when it comes to this particular topic. She spent lots of time in school. I spent very little time in school. I have a lot of knowledge um, in the area of practicality. I know that if I do this and I do that, I'm going to get this. Theory um, is a theory. And if you have a combination of both theory and practical knowledge, I believe that you, um, you wind up winning more than you lose. Um, I run into troubles. Uh, every once in a while when we're trying to do something radically different. I, I know what I know and I know how I can get there, but every once in a while there's a, there's a gap and that gap can only be filled in by what you would call the academic uh, kind of academic thinking. And so consequently I believe that the way to make this all work out is to have a combination. So um, there's a guy, his name was Boss Kettering, there's a school named after him. Uh, Kettering is a university um, just down the road from us in, in Flint, Michigan. That, that school, in essence, focuses on going to school for half the year and working in industry half the year so that you get a blend of um, reality and theory. And I believe, in fact, I hire a lot of people from that school and the other one is UD Mercy. I hire, and actually now lately, um, Lawrence Technological University. I find that the people that come out of there are more suitable to um, change than the ones that might come out from a pure academic standpoint. And it's even worse, I don't know, this may not be good, but it's even worse if you, if you don't take a break every once in a while and jump out into industry and then come back to academia. Um, I, um, that's, that's empirical data. It's not, I don't have anything to back it up, but that's what it looks to me. I believe that there should be a co-op situation where, and by the way, the other good thing about that is, is you get to pay down some of your debt before, uh, to me, Walking, I walked out of uh, university with no debt. And the reason for that was because I had a job. So I would go to school for maybe six hours. I would go to work for another eight. Then I would, you know, sleep when I could. And then on the weekends, I did whatever I needed to do to catch up in labs or do whatever I needed to do. Now, was I a good student? No. Mm -mm. If it was a D, it was for me. <laughs> I mean, I had a good time in school. I was uh, in sports and stuff like that, but I was not um, a scholastic wizard. But um, when I left college, when I walked out, I had three job offers. It was a really nasty time. It was really a, like a recession was going on. I had three job offers. And the reason for that was because I was a tool maker I knew how to draw. I could, uh, in those days, you actually did draw lines. And I had, I, had, uh, I had schooling. And even though I wasn't the best student, I had more to offer to um, companies than, than what the other guys did with just uh, an academic uh, degree. So I think, I think it's a good idea for Absolutely, I agree with you, I agree. And yeah. I would like to get to touch again about the design of the, the shape of the vehicle. And I, I think when you explain about Cybertruck, well, the shape, uh, how it could be exotic a little bit when you come to the design of the shape. How, how do you see maybe the most maybe inspiring designs maybe 
when you see the cyber truck why do you think the design looks like that, that exotic not normally where we have to know uh, traditionally in the vehicle it's, it's the design of the shape is different why mm. why design like that you think okay so when you're when you're designing a product uh, that you're going to sell to the general public um, you have two options to start with and this is going to sound sexist but it's true um, one is a feminine design and one is a masculine design a feminine design will have curves like women a masculine design will have straight lines um, mainly because uh, you have to have a contrast between the two and so that's kind of like how it's put into the marketplace. If you're going to design a truck, um, you don't usually put too many feminine lines down because straight lines appeal to men. If you were going to go to first principles, um, you would have, for a feminine product, or let's say a feminine car, you would have round bumpers, you would have roundish looking um, uh, windows maybe or something like that um, and and the reason for that is because to a feminine's eye to a, a woman's eye that looks nice if you're going to go after the masculine design then what you're going to see is lots of straight lines and if you look at that truck which is supposed to be masculine anyway look at it it's nothing but straight lines this is right back to uh, the Greek philosophy on how to, uh, to uh, put out the perfect design or the perfect image for a, a, a man. Why does a sword look like it looks? Why isn't it round? Why isn't it a scimitar? Why isn't it, why is the shield square or oblong? Why, you know, mainly because it was designed for a guy and that's just the way they did it and they they understood the appeal so you look at the cyber truck and does it look like the model 3 no does it look like the model y no does it look like the x or the s no why because those cars were made to appeal to women not so much to men and if you think about it the Model X has gull doors. They open up so that if a woman is trying to get the kids and the bags of groceries and all the other garbage that she's trying to lug along to get into the car, those gull doors are pretty nice. If it's raining out, you don't get rained on. That's, that's an appealing uh, function um, that, uh, that, that women can appreciate, or anybody can appreciate it, but it's, it's focused primarily on, the, um, on, the, on, the, on a woman. Easy to access, easy to, uh, easy to keep, you know, still looking good if it's raining out and whatnot. Men don't care. I mean, I don't care. If I walk out to the car, I don't have an umbrella. If I get soaking wet, I don't care. If I get in I, uh, with snow on my boots, clonk, clonk, and then I get in, I don't care. I just don't care not women. Women, <clears throat> they want it nice and clean. So if you can create the car to suit the, the, the potential buyer, you're, you're way down, you, 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 it makes it easy. So now you look at the Cybertruck. Love at first sight. I took one look, said, that's my next car. That's it. It was like one, I walked in and they were showing the uh, thing here and actually in this room is a uh, Every once in a while, uh, <clears throat> we, we'll, there's a TV in back of me. Actually, the TV's all over the place. Anyways, uh, and we turn this stuff on, and we look at it, and we voice our opinions on different things. So my wife, first look, that's hideous. I looked at it and said, that's the car I'm going to buy next. What? Are you just saying that? You know, that kind of stuff goes on. It's the truth. It's exactly what I want. I've been trying to talk people into timbre a timbre door, the, the, the hatch in the back, that's a timbre door. I've been trying to talk people into that for a long time. I said, hey, you know what, because I go hunting, I, 
<laughs> this is perfect. I'm, I, can, I can sleep in this damn thing. I, I, uh, I'll stay warm, um, on and on and on. My wife looked at it. Ugh, that thing's just hideous. I don't like it. I don't like it at all. And, and that's, my wife is very feminine and <laughs> I'm not Mr. Perfect. <laughs> so there you go. <clears throat> it's very interesting. I would like to ask you, uh, Sandy, about electric vehicle, for example. What could you think about, because there are many competitors now, but I know that you, you highlight more that this is more ahead of time. But maybe what yeah. could be an avoidable trade-off when it comes to designing electric vehicle? When you have this kind of road trip and you find something, this is an avoidable trade-off, maybe in design, performance. I know you, you are fascinated, but I find it impressing in, in design and the seat, etc. But... If you have a critical about what is, this is, could be an avoidable trade-off, there's something here missing, still missing. Okay, so, yeah. Okay, so I will tell you that um, I went into the start of that drive across the States uh, skeptical. Um, I had never, I had driven the car around the block a little bit and stuff, and I, I like the fact that it goes fast. And it tracks really, really well. But I had never turned on autopilot. And I, I really didn't spend that much time in it because I drive a Jeep Wrangler. It's, it's a, a totally different kind of a ride. But when we got going, I took the first turn and, uh, at driving. And I drove quite a ways. I, um, I drove, uh, I don't know two stops, 600 miles. So <clears throat> when I was driving, uh, I was playing with the car and I played with turning on autopilot. I wanted to see what it would do. I wanted to see how it would work. I wanted to see how, what I liked and didn't like. Okay, so there were a lot of things I did like. Um, I like the fact that I can look out the window. I don't do that. I was. Uh, at one time I raced cars, you're trained to look at the lines, look at um, apex. I, I don't want to get into it, but anyways, a race car driver does things different than an ordinary driver. Some people can turn their heads. You don't do that if you're racing because you're going to kill yourself. So don't do that. And, um, and that's the way I normally drove. And it took me probably a couple, 300 miles before I was looking out the windows. And then... I was pretty happy. The thing I hated about it was the damn thing always wants to follow the rules. It, it wants to go into the right-hand lane. I don't like the right-hand lane. I like to be on the left-hand lane. So the clicker would come on uh, and it would want to, sh you know, take, and it would, it would take me into the center lane or, in, or the extreme right-hand lane. And I didn't like that. So if it was going to be something I'd get rid of, that would have been it. Then we found out that there's an option and you can turn that off. And we did. <clears throat> and, um, the other thing I didn't like again was, uh, was on auto autopilot. And that was not so much the car, but the road system hasn't caught up to where the car is. And we had a very close encounter. Um, I, uh, uh, I almost killed us. Um, basically the car was zipped off the side of the road and it was heading into um, it was heading into a construction zone. Uh, that would have been really ugly if I wouldn't have been able to spin the car around and get it, uh, get it out of there, drive over the dirt for a while. That, um, that wasn't because of the car. That was because of the road. The road was, a bu uh, was buggered up. Somebody had removed the paint lines or put paint lines in where the car got confused. That's not the car's fault. So I didn't like that. Uh, apart from that, it's pretty hard to find something wrong. I, I'm a very critical guy. I've uh, thrown rocks at other things like the outside of the car and things like that. But as far as the driving characteristics or the ability to get from point A to point B in a, in a good and right way, it's very difficult to find something wrong. Now, I, I think that you should look at uh, bad points to figure out how to fix them. And I should also tell you that there is good points that I, I've never seen in another vehicle before. So 
when we got to um, Fremont, I got a chance to ride in the um, in the uh, Beta uh, um, um, a full self drive, and that uh, really was appealing. Now I'm looking at how I'm going to be able to get to work and back and, and, and do something in the interim. My life's really complicated right now and uh, I don't have a lot of time. I go to bed early, or sorry, go to bed late and I get up early and, and it's not a good life. And if I have to go from point A to point B, I really don't need or want to drive. I've done it for a long time. With the, um, the beta, um, full, uh, um, full self-drive, I can see me buying one of those, pushing a button and saying, you know, uh, get me to work or uh, I want to go and see my grandkids or something. And away it goes and it gets me there and I feel 100% comfortable and safe that it's going to get me to where I need to get to. That is 100% electrics and electronics and software. And I'm telling you what, that kicks some that kicks everybody else to the curb. Nobody's got anything like that. I've seen everybody's stuff. Nobody's got anything like it. Now there's only 35 guys that got it, and even even when I begged Elon Musk, I couldn't. He wouldn't give it to me. <clears throat> I don't think he trusts me. I could be wrong, but but anyway, uh, no. It's that's that's really really something to me. The big things uh, that are, that leave everybody else in the dust with Tesla is um, the electronics, anybody that goes and has a look at the boards, blown away. Electronic chips, they made their own, they took three NVIDIA chips and figured out how to turn it into two, and those two chips have got more, I don't, I have no, I don't know who makes those chips, but um, when you decap them and you look inside, nobody's got anything like that, nobody, nobody. I don't know where they are. Uh, uh, I didn't. I didn't ask to have it measured, but I'm sure that we're looking at. Um, anyway, so it that's that's. And then the battery pack. I'm I'm very happy that they've gone to uh, the 4680. I was hoping that somebody would do um, a 5070 or whatever. I thought that that was what was going to come next, but they surprised me. And quite frankly, it's a really nice. That's a really nice package, and um, and that's going to get rid of a lot of weight, and get rid of a lot of cost, and give you extended range and power. It's all good. So when it comes to that stuff, nobody is even close. Nobody. Fantastic. Yeah. So maybe if because I know you are advocate for, for example, hydrogen as and fuel cells. So if you can have a comparison between if we have electric vehicle and solar panel and hydrogen, uh, which one do you think maybe could be more advantageous in the long run? It depends on the application. Um, <clears throat> I think that batteries are just fine for cars. Uh, I don't see any reason to have a hydrogen car. However, I don't think batteries are the right solution for VTOL, vertical takeoff, uh, and landing machines. I think that that's a better application for hydrogen fuel cells. And I believe that we could put a fuel cell inside of a, a, VT, a VTOL and, um, and I could instantly load or unload those, those canisters and I could get from point A to point B in a hurry. And if you happen to live in California where traffic is horrific or New York, it's the way to go. And it's not like it's new. New York used to have um, little planes um, um, gyro, uh, uh, gyrocopters and what they would do is they would take off from the roof of one building and land on the roof of the next building that's what we need that's what New York needs they need that if you um, want to get on a subway and take your life in your hands I, I don't, I'm not a fan of subways I don't like them but, uh, but if you um, and helicopters they they uh, they're a little too heavy and they cost a lot of money. With a VTOL, I could see New York becoming um, uh, a really, really um, friendlier pr place as far as travel is concerned with a VTOL that's run by a fuel cell. 
I think that's the right way to go. Um, the other thing that I think is uh, suitable for, um, for hydrogen is uh, long distance um, trucking. I, uh, I don't have much hope for battery packs that weigh a lot of, well, weigh a lot, period. I just don't see that happening because no trucker is going to want to have battery packs uh, which are going to reduce the amount of, of cargo that he can carry. They're in this for the business. You don't, I don't want, I don't care to have that. I don't, I don't want none of that. I, I want to get from point A to point B the cheapest possible way. I want to be, it has to be reliable. And uh, I don't care about the economy, the environment. I only care about what's going to be in my pocket when I get all done. That's the way truckers work. That's the way they think. So uh, hydrogen would be a good, a good deal for them. And there's, there's a couple of reasons. One, I can swap out those tanks faster than I can fill up my diesel gas tank. And that's every minute counts when you're, when you're in that kind of stuff. So, uh, so that's, the kind of, um, that's the kind of thing that we're, we're looking at for, that's the kind of thing I'm looking at as far as, uh, as, far as uh, hydrogen is concerned but not cars. So we're going to end up a few questions. Uh, so first one about competition in, when it comes to automotive industry. What makes a company successful from your experience? The key element to be successful. Key elements for success? Um, number one is leadership. If you have good leadership, you're always, um, even the guy with the inferior product can win if you have good leadership. So that would be the first thing. Second thing, is kind of akin to it. You have to have a good workforce. If you have, you know, a good captain and a good crew, chances of success, no matter on what leaky barge you happen to be on, your success rate's gonna go up higher if you've got good leadership and, uh, and good workforce. The next thing after that, I guess you're starting to look at, do you have what the customer really and truly wants? Um, if you, uh, if you have a, um, a tool or if you have a product that comes into the marketplace that nobody cares about um, except for you, it, 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 it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a hopeless disaster. If you, if you try and create something that's going to be for a very, very small market, you're not going to be happy. It's not going to work out. And if you create something that winds up costing too much or is too complicated for use, you're going to lose. So a lot, of com a lot of companies come to us and they say, oh, we've got this. And that's the first three things we look at. Who's going to buy this? Um, how much are they going to be willing to pay for it? And can you be made at the, at the price point that you're, you kind of need to have it at? And if the answer to any of those is no, then we go into a, a design scrub to figure out how we, can, um, how we can make it, put it into the marketplace and make this guy happy or gal happy, um, and, uh, and make customers happy as well. So we have a program called Design Profit, and in essence, we put it in there, and the software gives us a hand and pushes everything into the right direction. So that's that's kind of how we make things work a lot of people put a big uh, emphasis on oh we have robots did you design for a robot robots are blind one-armed idiots can you put it together with your hand behind your back and your eyes closed no then you can't do the job it don't don't even think about buying a robot if elon musk if i'd have known him then i would have told him exactly that you are wasting your money because his car is not designed for a robot, period. So those are the kinds of things. Um, when, when I talk to executives, I, I tell them that their product um, and their success rate is going to be, uh, is going to be 10% technology, 90% psychology. That's the way it is. And uh, there's nothing in there for finance because if you keep those ratios in mind, if you're dealing with people or you're dealing with customers 
or you're dealing with the design of the product and you have that ratio, it'll all work out always. So Yeah, great. Yeah. So maybe a quick question here, because I think you highlight more about um, how to be creative and just design a problem that matters to people. When it comes to Elon Musk, for example, or Steve Jobs, they have like a chaotic mind. I don't know what's your um, way of thinking of them when you spoke with them and it was, for example, Elon Musk. What kind of maybe characteristic you think could be a good point and maybe also downside? I don't know if you can answer that for a student, maybe just to, to be different. And that's why we need to be different and not as, yeah, as a mm. leader and CEO, because we don't have this figure. It's rare to find people who are deep in tech and also leader and likable as a, as a figure as well. So what's your analysis yeah. for that? Well, that's, that's kind of tough. Um, I, I don't know how to do, I, I know what I know cold. Um, but I, I don't, I don't really, to me, um, to me, a leader, first off, is going to be something that nobody thinks that a leader should be, and that's humble. If, um, if you're arrogant, I, I, uh, <clears throat> I met, um, I met a lot of people when I first went to Ford in Japan. And one of the people that I met was Mr. Toyota, the guy who ran Toyota. And, um, and um, I was in a big meeting. There was 18, 18 of us that went to Japan. Two of us were grade eight, grade nine kind of engineers. Everybody else was a director or a VP or way up there. And these guys, that uh, these executives, um, were a little bit on the arrogant side. And um, because at that time, Toyota was small compared to Ford. And everybody knew that um, Henry Ford I had uh, given Toyota um, rights to use the Ford standard system. And it's like, I don't know, hundreds of thousands of pages. Everything from um, how to build a car to chicken soup everything was in those books. Anyway, the Ford guys were a little arrogant and, um, and Mr. Toyota said something that the other guys didn't really get because their interpreters wouldn't tell them um, what exactly Mr. Toyota said. But my interpreter, um, I had just saved her from getting run over by a forklift truck. Now her shoes got wrecked because I pulled her out of the way and a forklift truck ran over her shoes, but um, she felt a little bit of an obligation. And Mr. Toyota said something and I said, what did he say? And she said, where there's arrogance, there's opportunity. That's opportunity to defeat, right? Because everybody in the Orient, or I'm, I've been told I have to use Asia, but everyone in Asia kind of reads one book. It's a book called um, The Art of War by Sun Tzu. That book. Okay? This book, this book right here tells you how to be a good general. Actually, if you're a good general, you're a good leader. If you're a good leader, it doesn't matter what you're leading. As long as you put things into perspective, that, that, that works. And so, Number one on the hit parade for a good leader is hum humble. Um, know, know your limitations, to quote Dirty Harry. I don't know if you ever saw that movie, but um, anyway, you have to know what you're good at and what you're not. Um, I think that, uh, that uh, the, the, the state that you have to be in is to try and stay as calm as possible. Now, that's not me. I'm not very good at that. Um, I have a tendency to be a little too passionate or get a little too angry or laugh a lot. And that's, you, you got to be a little more stoic than that, but it's good to have that kind of, that kind of knowledge. And you, you have to continuously remember that there are other people in the room that probably are smarter than you. And 
Um, there's no such thing as the smartest guy in the room because no matter what the topic is, somebody else is going to know something you don't know. And, um, and those kinds of attributes, I think, is what I saw in Elon Musk. Certainly he reads a lot, and I found that most people that I've, um, I've got to know over the years that, uh, that, uh, that are good leaders, they read a lot. One of my favorite leaders was uh, uh, at Ford Motor Company, Mr. Jerosik, Max Jerosik. Max Jerosik read voraciously. I, I've never seen anybody consume a book as fast as him. I, at first I thought he was just kidding. But he really, he really can, he could zip through memo after memo. He knew all kinds of stuff. And this is prior to, you know, Google and the internet and stuff like that. It's very, very difficult to keep up with that guy because he was continuously learning, continuously striving toward, you know, I don't want to say nirvana, but it's the only thing I can think of. An, uh, Education can be a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily have to come out of a book, and it doesn't have to have a formula attached to it. But you can find out lots of stuff um, by going down an alley in, in, in Thailand, in, in Bangkok, just watching what's going on around you. Um, if you're observant, there's lots of things that, uh, that, that, uh, that you can see that a lot of the rest of the people miss out on. And I think a good leader is observant. He, he or she is going to be watching all the time for what's, uh, what's going on. Thank you. So thank you once again, Sandy, for being here. Such an honor to have you. And uh, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. I don't get uh, interviewed by pretty women very often, so I'm very happy. Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> thank nice you. <laughs> see you. See you later. Okay. Bye. All righty. All righty. Okay. Bye-bye.